Hey everyone, this episode is sponsored by Ledger. For the past decade, Ledger has been the global leader in digital asset security, trusted to secure more than 20% of the world's crypto assets. Celebrating 10 years of innovation, Ledger is making digital ownership more secure and accessible with their latest products, Ledger Stacks and Ledger Flex. These wallets feature the world's first secure touchscreens, simplifying your digital transactions while ensuring uncompromising security through its Ledger Secure Chip and proprietary OS. Plus, with the Ledger Security Key app, you can say goodbye to traditional passwords and step up your digital protection. Your entire crypto experience got a whole lot easier. Ready to protect your assets? Choose the most trusted name in hardware wallets, Ledger, and take control of your digital security today at ledger.com. Meet Kraken Institutional. Whether you're an asset allocator, a trading firm, or high net worth individual, Kraken Institutional unlocks the powerful tools you and your organization need to trade and manage crypto at scale. Reliable, easy to integrate, with white glove service and 24-7 support. Visit kraken.com slash institutions and get in touch today. This is not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss and is offered to U.S. customers through Payword Interactive Inc. View legal disclosures at kraken.com slash legal slash disclosures. All right, welcome back to another episode of Forward Guidance. And today I have a very special episode um, for longtime listeners of Forward Guidance. They will recognize the man on scene here, Dr. Uh, Stephen Moran. He is a senior strategist at Hudson Bay Capital. He is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute of Policy Research. He has worked at the U.S. Treasury during the Trump administration. And he is coming back, you know, three months ago, he was on the show and he released his active uh, treasury issuance paper in tandem um, with some other very smart economic uh, participants and, and researchers and doctors. And he's back here again today to do a launch interview for a new paper that he has that just gets into the, the new economic tools that are facing today that are really based in the, the recent election that occurred with Trump and a lot of the economic tools that he has been discussing. And so he wrote a paper that he is excited to be releasing in tandem with this interview that really gets into the weeds of understanding the economic implications. So, uh, Stephen, it's really great to have you on the show. I'm you know really honored that you chose us to, to come here and discuss your paper, and I can't wait to get into it. Yeah, thanks for having me back. You know, I think that the last time the paper with Nouriel that you mentioned before made made some waves and so forward guidance is, you know, is is the premier spot for debuting, a, you know, important and exciting new research as far as I could tell. <laughs> thanks for having me. That. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be great. So the, the title of your paper is A User's Guide to Restructuring the Global Trading System. I would love to just allow you to just set the stage in terms of the context of that paper, why you wrote it uh, before we get into the specifics. I guess let me let me first by giving a little disclaimer, you know, I speak only for myself and my own views. Uh, you know, th these are the views that you're going to hear today just reflect my own personal thoughts. They don't reflect uh, anything related to the Trump campaign. They don't reflect anything related to the Trump transition. They don't uh, reflect necessarily the views of Hudson Bay Capital or the Manhattan Institute. It's purely it's purely my own my own impression of things. Now that said, I think uh, you know we're we're to frame this paper the way that I the way that I'd think about it is to say that Donald Trump won the popular vote for Republicans for the first time since 2004. Uh, he delivered both chambers of Congress and the White House. You know he has a very strong Democratic mandate for pursuing. Uh, what he said that he was going to do on the campaign trail, a major portion of which is to restructure the global trading system to make it more fair and reciprocal to, uh, you know, to Americans. His supporters, President Trump, they tend to think that the system is unfair towards towards American workers, uh, and they've talked about a variety of things they'd like to do to try and make it uh, make it let to make it more fair and reciprocal. But I think there's a lot of confusion in markets about exactly what the tools available are and what do those tools do and exactly what's going to happen if we use them. There's certainly been a lot of what I would consider to be politically motivated hysteria about them, uh, uh, about the tools. And I think that it's important to understand the range of options that are available. And so the way that I'd conceptualize this paper is to think about it as sort of a catalog of what the options are, right? If you want to, if you want to start restructuring the global trading system, what are the tools that are available to you? How do you use them? What are the side effects that might, that, that might happen from the, from, from using those tools that you might not like? And then what steps can you take to try and mitigate those side effects to try and minimize the adverse consequences and consequences in the economy? And so, you know, the paper is designed, I think, to try and help market practitioners uh, get a sense of what are the options on the table, what might be coming down the pipeline. Uh, it's not advocacy for the particular policies. It's sort of more, I think there's a lot of, a lot of uncertainty about what the actual tools themselves are and, and how they'd be used. 
Awesome. Yeah. So obviously we're going to have the paper linked in full detail uh, with the show here. But aside from that, throughout this episode here, we're going to actually unpack some of the specifics and just provide a, a showcase of these specific implications and this catalog that you mentioned. Of. So I just want to start off the bat here by just level setting on getting an understanding of the context that we're heading into with the result of this campaign and why we're even talking about these ideas of, of terrorists, et cetera. So I'd love for you to just begin by unpacking this, this regime that we live in of, of a U.S. dollar reserve complex. And what are some of the current issues that we're starting to see there? Why is there, you mentioned this idea of economic imbalances. I would love for you to just explain what are those economic imbalances and why have they occurred and why is it leading to the discussion of these new potential tools? Yeah, totally. So look, I think I think it's important if you're if you're if you think that the global trading system is 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 unfair and in need of some restructuring. Uh, I think you need to ask why is that the case, right? Like what's out what's out of whack, right? Why why do we run persistently? Uh, you know, very deeply negative trade balances. Why is the current account not uh, balanced for more than a few months uh, on any reasonable basis in almost half a century? What's going on that uh, you know that that we run these imbal- these imbalances in the international sector? And the answer is that the dollar, uh, the currency markets, have not been able to reach an equilibrium that would balance trade. Right? Normally in economics, you know, you'd think that one country exports a lot, another country imports a lot. The exporting currency goes up. And that pushes the exports down and the imports of the other country down as well. And that leads towards trade, right? Sorry, towards trade balance. Currencies move over time to balance trade uh, and equilibrate international trade, right? That hasn't happened, right? So the question is, why hasn't that happened? Uh, the answer, I believe, uh, lies in the fact that the dollar is the global reserve currency. And there is, in fact, you know, more than one model for determining exchange rates, right? There's a trade model that I just discussed, but there's also models for international finance, for investing, where currency values are a function of the investment opportunity set in each country, right? And in that world, currencies move up and down in value uh, because investors want to own the assets, right? Now, I think where things get out of whack is that investors, or sorry, not investors, savers, wind up buying dollar assets, reserve assets, U.S. Treasury securities, uh, not necessarily because they like the return profile of the United States. They think the yield is a little bit higher in this part of the yield curve and a little bit lower in that part of the yield curve in another country, and that there's a good reason for owning you know, this U.S. security over that German bond or what German bond or, or whatever. Um, but they buy U.S. securities for reserve accumulation purposes, right? And there's many reasons why foreign savers would buy reserves. Sometimes it's to manage their own domestic currency. That's the case of you know China. And sometimes it's to facilitate trade between two totally different countries, right? If uh, you know Indonesia and Australia are trading with each other, that trade is probably being collateralized and facilitated by U.S. Treasury securities, right? Regardless of the return characteristics of the U.S. Treasury, right? When that trade is occurring, they don't stop and ask, "Okay, is the unemployment rate moving higher or lower? Is inflation moving up or down? Is the Fed going to hike or is the Fed going to cut?" Right? Like they have to buy those securities to 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 facilitate trade with each other, and what that does is it creates a very inelastic demand for dollar securities, right? That demand for dollar securities is totally insensitive to any of the fundamentals of the trade balance, fundamentals of the U.S. as an investment uh, as an investment option among different asset classes, uh, and that very inelastic demand for U.S. Treasury securities pushes the dollar up, right? And it keeps the dollar overvalued and elevated, and it keeps other currencies artificially suppressed, so that trade winds up never balancing and the current account winds up never balancing and this is a type of this is a type of equilibrium that economists would sort of think of as as what i would describe as a triffin world right named after the belgian economist robert triffin and you know if you push it too far there's lots of stuff lit written on the triffin dilemma where this arrangement eventually gets so out of whack that it breaks down and the reserve currency collapses and blah 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 and you were look we're really far from something like that i don't think anything like that is very plausible but the persistent effects on trade have certainly been something that have devastated large swaths of this country over the last few decades. Yeah, so you mentioned the this Triffin world idea, and I just want to uh, quote out a, a section of the paper here related to that. But you, you write that, indeed, the paradox of being reserve currency is that it leads to permanent twin deficits, which in turn lead over time to an unsustainable accumulation of public and foreign debt that eventually undermines the safety and reserve currency of such large debtor economies. So, you know, obviously you're articulating there is, is where is the natural, you know, continuation that this leads to in this Triffin world that you mentioned? Um, I just want to circle back on, on just unpacking the, the implications and also like the real world implications of what it means to have 
what you're basically saying is that we have a persistently overvalued U.S. dollar because of it being a part like the the key uh, asset within this reserve system. You know, you mentioned this idea we just talked about in terms of twin deficits, but there's also some implications on on the manufacturing world, and I think that ties in a lot to the societal and real world implications of of this Trump policy that we're starting to see there. So, we'd love just to just unpack like what are the real world implications of this idea of a persistent overvaluation of the U.S. dollar. Yeah, so totally. So if you take, you know, look, like you said, if you take the if you take the Triffin Dynamics, you know, sort of like all the way to the limit, you get to a dilemma of, a, in, you know, a turning a tipping point, right, where bad stuff happens. Or look, that's not plausible in 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 you know probably in my lifetime, but certainly not in the near future, uh, you know, in 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 sort of U.S. financial markets. Uh, but what it but what this inelastic demand does do is it creates lots of demand for dollar assets that is just a function of trade between third countries. Right, it has nothing to do with the United States, right? Uh, or it may have to do with other countries managing their currencies, right? Manipulating their currencies, whatever the re- whatever the reason. That pushes the dollar up over the longer term, and it creates persistent trade imbalances and prevents the dollar from depreciating in a way that would serve to balance trade over the over the longer term. And as a result, you get these persistently larger. Uh, and longer term, you know, trade deficits and current account deficits, which have had, you know, sort of severe economic consequences for manufacturing and the export sector in this country. Uh, and I think that this has driven a, a significant portion of, uh, you know, of, of some of the uh, of some of the reason why why President Trump, you know, really surged back into power. Okay, so something that was really interesting that I learned from this is you you discuss the because there's always this idea of okay, you know, the the, the world reserve currency, you know, the U.S. is running such high deficits, and the question is always is. When does it start mattering? Obviously, you just nailed out the the you know logical end of it. But what was really interesting was this discussion and analysis you have around just the the total share of GDP of, of the U.S. versus the rest of the world. So that to me was really interesting because, as you showed in some charts in the paper, is that decades ago when when the share of total GDP was quite high for the U.S., it seems like this wasn't as much of an issue. But what I'm what I'm understanding and, and correct me if I'm wrong is that as that total share of GDP has been decreasing, it's led to these increasing strains. Is that correct? Yeah, that's totally correct. And so if you think about it this way, so so just to, just imagine that there's trade going on between, you know, any two third countries, like I feel like I said, Australia and Indonesia a few seconds ago, right? If they're small relative to the United States, then they could buy a bunch of treasuries to facilitate trade between them. And it wouldn't really, you know, it wouldn't really affect our markets because the flows are just too small, right? But if they're big relative to the United States, and then they buy treasuries to, f- to facilitate trade between them, then it is going to affect our markets because the flows just become larger as a share as a share of the overall uh, as a share of the overall treasury market, right? And the overall do- dollar market. And so if you think about, you know, this Triffin dynamics creating an equilibrium in currency markets that's farther away from the equilibrium that would balance trade from the trade equilibrium, right? That distance is going to be really small if the U.S. is huge as a share of global economy. Right, that distance is going to grow as the U.S. share of the global economy declines. Right, so as you've had much faster growth from China and lots of other countries in the last 20 years, and the U.S. share of global GDP declined, right, and it's gone up in the last few years, right, which has sort of coincided with with uh, which has sort of coincided in the last you know 10 years or so, which has coincided with a a decline in um, in the size of these effects on on the economy. Um, but as the as that glo- U.S. share of global GDP has has declined, uh, the distortions imposed on the U.S. economy have grown as a result, right? And so the U.S. economy declined from about uh, you know about forty percent of global economy you know in the sixties or something down to a low of about twenty percent or something you know like uh, going into the GFC or something, right? And that was you know of course the period at, at when. The U.S. share of GDP was declining was, of course, the period of the most aggressive uh, losses in the manufacturing sector. Um, you know, and and I think a, a good portion of it is because this disequilibrium, uh, this trade disequilibrium, that's a function of what you'd think of as the Triffin equilibrium, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, there are you know consequences of this demand. There's the higher dollar. You know, people say that there's a lot that there's much lower borrowing rates for the United States as a result. Personally, I don't think that's such a huge effect because the United States borrows much more expensive than lots of other peer countries that we have. Yeah, and then there's the the third consequence too that you mentioned, which is this idea of financial uh, extraterritoriality. Um, so those yeah. three, <laughs> love that word. It took me a few times to make sure I knew I had to say that properly. But um, based on those consequences within this Triffin world and these distortions that you just mentioned. And, you know, on comes the idea of, of tariffs, right? So now we have this idea of tariffs as being a potential solution to bring back that equilibrium. So maybe as we bring it to this discussion of tariffs, 
just get everybody in the same playing field. You can just explain the broad, you know, economics of tariffs, how they work and how they interact with uh, currencies as being sort of the, the release valve in a way. Yeah, sure. So, but before we get there, I think we should we should absolutely hit the point you made a second ago, which is financial extraterritoriality. You know, yeah. I think you know, I I think if you think about this huge demand for reserve assets, right? Like it pushes the dollar up. Okay, we just discussed that a bunch. It you know pushes interest rates down. I think it doesn't push them down by a huge amount because I just don't see that the U.S. borrowing rate is is I don't see consequences of the U.S. borrowing rate is that much lower uh, than than the rest of the world. Um, but it also gives you the ability to impose U.S. economic, sorry, U.S. policy on the world without having to move military assets, right? And so we can sanction people, we can cut them out of the global trading system, uh, we can, you can, we can bring economies, you know, like we did to Iran, you know, and, and North, and we, and we have to North Korea, we can bring them down to the down to the ground, right, and really impoverish them by using the financial sanction system that's built up around the dollar and the treasury security as the global reserve currency and asset, right? And that ability to impose our will in other countries is a function of us being the reserve asset, right? So the real the real trade-off, I think the trade-off is often presented as as one of lower borrowing yields, right? I don't see that I don't see that myself uh, when I look at you know sort of economic data, when I look at you know global financial markets, I see the real trade-off as one of being the ability to have enormous power globally without actually using military assets through the financial sanction system versus the trade-off of having an overvalued dollar. Uh, that does that does damage on our on our manufacturing and export sector, right? That's the result of a of a terms of trade issue, right? Of the fact that you know the, there's a currency misalignment. Now there are various steps you can take to address the currency misalignment. Uh, one of which is to use tariffs, right? Which is a tool that President Trump used extensively in his first term of office, uh, and which I expect we will see a lot more of uh, in in the near future. And and I think that you know. People have, broadly speaking, um, got the forecasts about tariffs very, very wrong, uh, as they often did last term as well. I think they haven't they haven't wound up working the way people thought they would. You know, and in particular, I think if you look at the experience over the over the last Trump administration, you know, there was zero discernible rise in uh, there was zero discernible rise in inflation in the macroeconomic data. There was zero discernible drag on economic growth. Right in the macroeconomic data as a result of these tariffs, and these were not, you know, trivially small tariffs. Uh, you know, I think the experience, generally speaking, uh, you know, was was pretty good. Yeah, maybe we can use um, that previous administration, so 2018, 19, sure. as, as a benchmark to understand this, these mechanics. Because you're right, you know, tr- tariffs is, is sort of this like a uh, quite loaded term right now, where where people hear it and intuitively think, okay, you know, there's going to be high inflation. Uh, you know, it's guaranteed, but obviously you've broken it down that it's a lot more nuanced than that. So maybe we can start with the first step there, which is how do these, you know, what are the economics of tariffs? And then how does the, the currency offset dynamic that you explained also come into that fact? But we can use the 2018, 19 as like a, as a benchmark for this discussion. Yeah, totally. So look, I think, I think what people have failed to appreciate is that uh, currencies, as we said a moment ago, you know, like they, move to find an equilibrium, right? The question is what equilibrium are they finding? And when something changes in international trade or international capital flows, currencies will adjust, uh, you know, in in part as a result, right? To partially reflect that. And so what happened last time in 2018, 2019 is basically that the dollar moved, uh, the remedy moved to pretty much offset the tariffs on, on China. And so if you look at the effective tariff rate uh, on China in the 2018 2019 trade war the effective tariff rate went up by uh, roughly 17 you know 17.3 something like that 17 percentage points and the reason the effective rate is less than 25% is just because you know some products are exempted you know uh, there are some there are some exemptions there's all sorts of reasons why the effective rate may be different than the statutory rate um, or the announced rate so the effective rate went up by about 17 points what happened to dollar china Dollar China moved from a low, you know, from the low in dollar China to the high in dollar China over this period, right, right, right as the trade war was coming to a close in the fall of 2019. Uh, dollar China moved higher by, I think, about 15 and a half, 15, 15 and a half percentage points. What that meant is that the move in the currency almost completely, not entirely, but almost completely offset the change in the tariff, right? What does that mean, right? So, so let's work through the economics of this, right? What does that mean? That means that the after-tariff dollar import price of goods coming from China was practically unchanged, right? Not totally unchanged, but, but practically unchanged, right? And for such a big move in the tax rate, in the tariff rate, right, the actual after-dollar 
import price was almost unchanged, right? So that's why we didn't see significant inflation, right? And actually, over this period, inflation went down, not up, right? If you look at CPI inflation, it pretty much went sideways. If you look at, you know, if you want to look at PCE inflation, which, the, you know, the Fed targets, and of course, I've written extensively about that, you know, but if you look at PCE inflation, it went from slightly below the Fed's target to even further below the Fed's target over this period. The reason we didn't have any material inflation for what was actually, you know, a, a substantive shock to, to policy uh, is because, you know, markets, financial markets moved and currencies offset this. And in the end, you know, it, it, Tend, it turned it tended not to matter and of course there's all sorts of implications for that not just for inflation but for who bore the burden of this right and so if you get to a situation in which uh you know treasury is taking in revenue because of the tariff income prices domestically don't materially increase because the currencies offset them but at the same time the renminbi weakened even further the net of that is that china's purchasing power effectively went down chinese consumers effectively became poorer because their currency went down at the same time that revenue came into treasury. So I think that the way that a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of economists who would look at this and who, who would look at the experience of the last trade war sympathetically to the administration would say, look, this was actually very successful. Uh, you know, China paid for the revenues, uh, you know, that treasury took in. There was no material increase in inflation. And in the macroeconomic data, it's impossible to find it. There was no material increase in inflation and there was no material drag on growth. Uh, and so, you know, things tended to actually work out pretty well from last time. Now, of course, there's, you know, numerous microeconomic studies that argue otherwise that I've sort of addressed in the paper. And I'm happy to get into that if it's, it's, if it's of interest to you. Yeah, I think it'd be great to, to compare because obviously, you know, we're a macro show. We always like I intuitively think for the top down, but would be curious to just, yeah, contextualize the bottom up, uh, you know, considerations. You know, look, there's a whole bunch of academic studies that have come out in the last few years of, of, of the trade war. That basically look at, you know, they, 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 they tend to look at sort of product level prices and sort of say, OK, you know, the prices moved up for this much tariff, tariff good compared to this other good that wasn't tariffed. And therefore, we're going to attribute, you know, pass through to the tariff. Right. And these academic studies, you know, and, and I discuss I discuss a number of them, you know, at, at you know, at length in, in, in the paper. You know, look, they tend to find that tariffs are completely passed through, right? Which again is, is the exact opposite of what I just said happened in the macroeconomic data, right? So there is this question of how do you reconcile the microeconomic data with the macroeconomic data? And I think that there's a there's a handful of answers to this, right? One of them, one of the things that I that I find most persuasive is that uh, you know, re-export causes what economists would call a significant identification problem for the microeconomic studies, right? And so if you think about China evading the tariffs by sort of re-exporting through third countries, right? So they send the products to, you know, Vietnam or Mexico or something. They do like a tiny amount more value added to them. And then it gets counted. Then the entire thing gets counted as a Vietnamese or Mexican export to the United States instead of a Chinese export to the United States, even though 90% of the value added is from China. That's a way of getting around the tariffs that I think the Trump administration will really look into cracking down on, but has sort of been certainly in practice for the, for the last four or five years. That creates a, a, an impossible problem to identify the exports that are Chinese, right? So if China engages in re-export for the product that it would have to absorb the tariff on, that it can't pass through the price increase to consumers, those products get labeled as Vietnamese or Mexican instead of Chinese. The products that China feels that it can pass through the tariff on to the consumer, it will continue to export as from China because they can make Americans bear the cost of that, right? Now, whether you there's there's a whole economics literature on who bears the cost of taxes for all different kinds of taxes it's called incidents in the public finance literature tax incidents, tax incidents and you know the bottom line from this literature is that whoever is more as economists would say inelastic bears the tax someone who can adjust their behavior to avoid the tax will not bear the tax someone who can adjust their behavior to avoid the tax is forced to bear is forced to bear the economic burden of the tax right in these academic studies what you get is that goods that can be re, goods that China would have to absorb the increase on. They wind up relabeling them as Vietnamese or Mexican or whatever, right? Goods that the U.S. consumer is highly inelastic on and that China knows consumers will have to absorb the, the tax increase on continue to be labeled as Chinese. That creates an insurmountable empirical problem in the microeconomic data for, I, for correctly identifying which goods are hit by the tariffs and which goods are not hit by the tariff. And so I think that causes, that causes a, a major error in the conclusions of these papers. And of course, I think that there's a few other, you know, a few other things wrong with this literature as well. 
you know, I think that they study some short-term effects and when they should be thinking about some various long-term effects. I think they also find, you know, a couple of them find that the pass-through is, you know, much more for the wholesaler than the retailer, that the importer uh, sort of absorbs higher prices, but that they can't, but they have trouble passing those prices on to final consumers. And so even though, so consumer price inflation doesn't move higher, but retailer, uh, sort of whole, you know, wholesaler or retailer margins go down and the margins of the selling companies go down rather than the consumer prices moving higher. Look, I think that if you have a competitive market over time, those companies will find ways to avoid, you know, to, to improve that, right? There'll be competition among Chinese exporters to lower their prices because now they're more you know, the currencies move so they can do so, right? For the, you know, the the importers will move their business elsewhere. So, you know, I, I think there's a whole variety of reasons why I'm skeptical of the conclusions from that literature. I think there's, you know, some motivated reasoning going on. Um, yes. And I always come back to, look, where was the evidence in the macroeconomic data? I don't, you know, I don't see any. So, okay, let me see if I got this straight here. So it feels like basically, you know, for a practitioner listening to this and trying to to piece apart understanding the potential implications of this policy, there's there's two main considerations. The first one is the context of the business cycle that we're in when the tariffs are implemented. So, you know, as you mentioned, uh, the degree to which the currencies will move, you know, currencies can move for obviously they'll, they'll, they'll you know, price in the tariff, but they'll also move for other reasons, you know, like we're at in the economic cycle, whether we're hiking or, you know, lowering interest rates. So there's, there's considerations yeah. to the, the currency moves that are based on where we're at in the business cycle. And then there's also, you know, this idea of currency offsetting, you, you, you've mentioned in the paper that um, the, the underlying idea of it is based on a number of assumptions. And I'll just kind of quickly summarize them. But you mentioned, yeah. you know, one being the exchange rate must move by the right amount. Primitive and intermediate value added in final exports originate predominantly in the exporting nation. Pass through from exchange rates to export of prices is complete. Importantly, since imports are often invoiced in US dollar, the exchange rates don't automatically affect. Instead, a strengthening in the US dollar improves export of profit margins if exchange rates do not pass through into prices. And then lastly, you mentioned pass through from wholesale import to retail consumer prices is complete. So basically, there's this bucket of we're at in the context of the economy, and then these key assumptions that are baked onto it. Is that correct? Yeah, totally. And and look, you know, I think there's a variety of reasons why currencies move to offset tariffs, right? And you know, I I you know I, I go through some of the theoretical literature on why that happens, right? It, you know, the tariff country, uh, you know, the trade balance improves, and so all else equal, the currency would move to offset that. Uh, the tariff, the tariffing country, uh, you know, the central bank may decide that it has to hike rates a little bit because growth has improved inflation, you know, inflation might be, you know, might be moving up and that'll also cause the currency to move and then force all those, uh, those outcomes, right? So there's a whole bunch of reasons why currencies would offset tariffs. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why, you know, there's various cross currents that might not be, you know, that might, that might prevent that. Now, one thing I would mention is that if you look at the 2018, 2019 experience, it's true that the Fed was cutting rates at the time, which some people point to is that's the reason why the dollar moved higher. However, those the amount of hikes that the market was looking for in that period actually was declining, right? The spread, the yield spread advantage of two of two year treasury notes over G7 treasury notes was actually declining over that period because the market was actually pricing out fewer future Fed hikes, right? This is a period in which the Fed had sort of, you know, was halfway through its hiking cycle. It was extrapolating the hiking cycle would go much, much further. And in fact, the hiking cycle shortly stopped and then went into reverse, right? And so even though the Fed had been hiking over some course of this period, the actual market implied amount of Fed hawkishness relative to other countries was declining over this period. So the currency was actually moving against interest rate differentials and not with interest differentials, right? So, so that's not a really uh, convincing explanation for why the dollar moved higher in, in 2018, 2019. I mean, look, you know, is it possible that the currency doesn't offset things this time? Uh, you know, sure, it's possible, you know, like an asteroid could, you know, hit anywhere you know, like things happen, right? Uh, you know, but again, it's an all else equal argument. And if the dollar was, if the dollar was uh, depreciating for some other reason, it would depreciate by more in the absence of the tariffs. Um, and, you know, I, I, I see little reason to expect that this would play out differently than 2018, 2019. Hmm, but of course, it. you know, others disagree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so last question before we move into uh, the actually conceptualizing what might actually happen in the specific, you know, upcoming policies is um, just making sure that we've covered our bases in terms of understanding what is this trade off idea. So really, what it comes down to is, okay, if our if, if what we're trying to figure out is whether these tariffs are going to be inflationary or not, you know, and you have a table in the paper there where you break it down, which is it really comes down to how much 
does the currency offset the change in the tariff? So you you break down, you know, what's the potential impact on inflation, the incidents, trade flows, revenue, et cetera. So is there anything you want to add yeah. there before we get into conceptualizing what might actually happen here? You know, look, I think I think you know the tariffs were non inflationary in 2018, 2019. Uh, I, I think that that seems that seems very uh, you know very strong um, confidence to me. Um, I think a lot of the reason why they were not inflationary was because the currency moved to offset them. If you don't, ha- if the currency moves to offset them, you don't get inflation. Treasury takes in revenue, and the and the tariff country ultimately pays the cost of the of the tariff because their purchasing power declines. Right. And by the way, it's worth noting that if you look at about the amount of revenue that the tariffs raised, it was about a third of the cost of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Right. So, in that sense, you know the the tax cuts on Americans were financed by taxes on China. Right. So I think this is viewed as an overall very successful package when all these things work together correctly. If you don't get currency offset, right. Oh, sorry. You know, but if that happens, then, you know, the ultimate, you know, prices experienced by Americans haven't changed very much. And so there's little there's little incentive for firms to really, uh, you know, move their supply chains quickly or aggressively. Right. Um, and so you might wind up not having such a huge impact on the trade balance because, uh, you know, things haven't really moved enough to incentivize huge readjustment of, of, of trade flows because the ultimate prices was offset. Price changes were offset by the currency. However, what you've done is you've improved burden sharing, right? And so if the U.S. is providing reserve assets to the world, and that has exerted a significant downward pressure on our tradable sector, on our export sector, on our manufacturing sector, what you've done in this context where you've managed to raise revenue paid for by weaker currencies from other countries is you've improved burden sharing because the revenue that the government takes in that finances lower taxes and higher government expenditures for Americans was effectively paid for by the third by the tariff nation, right? So burden sharing has been improved. If you don't get currency offset, then you have to deal with the effects of the higher prices. You will experience some reallocation of trade flows because the higher prices will incentivize companies to move their supply chains. So that will cause repatriation of activity. It will cause companies to move out of China or wherever is being tariffed. It will cause them to move back to the U.S., French, or whatever. Um, but you will also collect less revenue because the imports from the tariff nation come down, right? So there's ultimately a trade-off between do you want revenue or do you want to reallocate trade from the rest of the world? And there's a, there's a, you know, there's a tension between them, but I think in the eyes of a lot of – I would imagine that in the eyes of a lot of folks that, that are going to be working in, in a Trump administration, either of those outcomes is pretty good. You either, you either sort of bring lots of industry back and, and you know, get the manufacturing sector here booming, or you raise a ton of revenue. I mean, you know, I, and either of those is considered to be a bad thing. Hey, everyone. This episode is sponsored by Ledger. For the past decade, Ledger has been the global leader in digital asset security, trusted to secure more than 20% of the world's crypto assets. Celebrating 10 years of innovation, Ledger is making digital ownership more secure and accessible with their latest products, Ledger Stacks and Ledger Flex. These wallets feature the world's first secure touchscreens, simplifying your digital transactions while ensuring uncompromising security through its Ledger Secure Chip and proprietary OS. Plus, With the Ledger Security Key app, you can say goodbye to traditional passwords and step up your digital protection. Your entire crypto experience got a whole lot easier. Ready to protect your assets? Choose the most trusted name in hardware wallets, Ledger, and take control of your digital security today at ledger.com. All right, back to the show. Meet your secure, reliable, institutional crypto partner, Kraken Institutional. Whether you're an asset allocator, a trading firm, or high net worth individual, Kraken Institutional unlocks the full suite of tools you and your organization need to trade and manage crypto at scale. But it's more than just powerful products. It's about enabling you to build and grow your crypto practice via deep liquidity, industry-leading security, and white glove service. Think 24-7 support from an award-winning account management team and expert guidance through your institutional crypto journey, from onboarding to product demos and more. Experience it for yourself. Visit kraken.com slash institutions and get in touch today. This is not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss and is offered to U.S. customers through Payward Interactive Inc. View legal disclosures at kraken.com slash legal slash disclosures. Okay, so let's get into speculating a little bit on the, the realm of possibilities of what could occur here during this, this Trump administration based on some of the you know ideas that they've said so far. So, you know, on aggregate, you mentioned in the paper that there is a distinct possibility that overall Trump policy could end up being outright disinflationary. So I want to I break apart in piecemeal 
why that is because obviously we're, there's there's the tariff a- aspect and i want to dig into specifically what we're seeing that might happen there and then also some of the other economic policies that they might be pursuing in terms of you know drill baby drill let's get some oil going uh lower oil prices at the same time that you know we're lowering uh you know tax rates uh for, for corporations and those ideas so just would love to hear overall how you're thinking about that and how you're getting to some of the, the conclusions you have on on what could happen and and what are some of those other possibilities if you think about what happened in 2018, 2019, you know, we had three and a half percent unemployment and uh, declining inflation. How was that possible? I think that the way that that was possible is that the administration was taking extremely active steps to liberalize the supply side, to facilitate supply side growth. And so therefore, even as demand was expanding briskly, the supply side was able to expand at a similar pace so that you could have very low unemployment, very strong GDP growth and still not experience material inflationary pressure. A major part a major part of that is is regulatory. Now, you know, economists tend not to really do a good job studying regulations because they're hard to measure. You know, it's very easy to measure a tax rate. It turns out that actually maybe it's sometimes not so easy, but it's much easier to measure a tax rate. You know, like uh, the tariff is 25%, or I just told you a moment ago, it's actually the effective tariff is 17 points, right? So even, it's, still, it's still not so easy to measure taxes, but it's, it's much easier, right? And that applies, generally speaking, to most people. You know, you have lots of observations. It's pretty easy, right? Regulations are like very heterogeneous, right? And every company is facing like a different regulatory set of things that it cares about because it is involved in different types of activities. There's many, many different agencies that issue regulations. They're enforced uh, with extremely varying degrees of uh, of of, of uh, activism, um, and so as a result, you know, re- economists do a bad job studying regulations. But they're enormously important for they're enormously important for uh, for how the how the economy functions, um, and they're important not just because um, you know they determine what types of activities get undertaken, but they make everything more expensive, right? You have to, uh, you know, you have to comply with the regulations, right? That requires significant legal and compliance uh, costs. You have to engage in activities that increase the cost of doing business um, because you have to sort of spend money on stuff that you wouldn't necessarily spend money on. Uh, you're prohibited from doing lots of things. It can be very difficult to build a factory uh, or a house, uh, you know, or, or, you know, whatever product it is that, you, that you're trying to build. And these things get into, you know, the entire economy, right? Um, and last, last Trump administration, they had a rule called one and two out, uh, which meant that for every new rule uh, that, that the federal officials wanted to put on the books in the Code of Federal Regulations, they had to take two old ones out, right? So they had to repeal two regulations for every new one. Who knows what it's going to be this time? Uh, at his talk at the Economic Club of New York, uh, President Trump suggested one and ten out, um, which obviously is much more aggressive than one and, one and two out. Um, but... You know, I think that this is this is very, very significant for the economy, and I think that it's enormously underappreciated by economists just how difficult this makes the supply side. So, for example, if you could build tons more housing um, in this economy at a much cheaper cost because it turned, you know, because you didn't have to sort of comply with all these regulations and there were no zoning zoning concerns or whatever, the price of housing would be much lower. Regulations prevent construction of additional supply, which restricts supply, which keeps prices higher, right? And that's very inflationary, right? So deregulation is not just disinflationary, it's outright deflationary. Um, and the extent to which you are capable and, and, and quick in doing it can determine just how deflationary it is. And that's true also in the energy realm, right? And I think that getting energy prices lower is a strategic priority for for. For the incoming administration, it will be a strategic priority for the incoming administration. Energy goes into everything, right? It's not just you know, yes, it's filling up your filling up your tank at the pump every week, but that cost of filling up the tank, uh, you know, also applies to all the workers that go to every job. And so, uh, every company has to pay its workers more over time uh, if their cost of living increases because the gas price goes up, right? And so, when you get the gas price down, everything becomes cheaper. It goes into all manufacturing. It goes in, you know. It goes into everything. Energy prices go into the entire economy. And I think that the administration will be pretty determined to make energy abundance uh, and energy cheapness uh, a real thing um, to get uh, American industry and the American economy booming, uh, which, you know, is is very powerful uh, for growth and very deflationary as well. Something in the paper you mentioned is that how the the administration is viewing national security and trade policy is basically intertwined. I want to ask you how unique is that circumstance and how does it lead into how they might actually implement tariffs? Because you you had mentioned in there that they could end up doing like a, a stage gate staggered approach to, to tariffs, et cetera. So just would love to hear how unique is that idea of how intertwining those both and how does that, you know, create some implications in how they actually implement tariffs? 
Yeah, totally. So um, it's so this has actually been the default for, I think, a lot of American history. And certainly if you go back to the Cold War, uh, you know, sort of trade policy and and security policy were deeply intertwined. And the U.S., you know, the United States opened its markets and provided preferential terms, uh, preferential trading access to a lot of countries, uh, you know, preferential tariff rates as well to a lot of countries around the world because it was interested in rebuilding democracies. It was interested in creating new democracies. It was interested in fortifying democracies. It was interested in creating allies against the Soviet Union globally because we were in a Cold War, right? Uh, it also had the idea that it was under no other no obligation to enrich the Soviet Union and its allies and that enriching one's uh, mortal enemies uh, during the Cold War could prove to be a major strategic mistake because it made your enemy more dangerous. Um, and so trade policy sought to deny advantages to the Soviet Union and its allies and gave advantages at great cost to Americans to our allies in an attempt to, you know, sort of create buffers against the Soviet Union. The notion that the two would be separate is sort of really, you know, a very, you know, 1990s end of history type of attitude that there are no real security threats, right? But hey, guess what? You know, it's 2024 and there are real security threats again. Uh, and so I expect those to become increasingly re-intertwined over time. Uh, the idea that you can sort of that you have another country that sort of says its goal is to displace you as the as the global hegemon and basically to to destroy your economy and, and your society over the course of decades. Um, you know, the idea that you would structure trade policy to enrich them and impoverish yourself. Uh, you know, sort of seems, I, I think, kind of silly. So I, I do expect these things to grow increasingly uh, re-intertwined over time. Um, and I think, you know, what you're mentioning is that is, is the implementation of the tariffs will be, I think, uh, aimed at this, right? So, you know, so one of, the, one of the things that I mentioned is that, you know, the tariff numbers that people are talking about now are much bigger than the tariff numbers that we had in 2018, 2019, you know, certainly 60% on China, 10% on the, on the rest of the world. Uh, you know, those are, those are much larger numbers than we had last time. Um, to avoid shocking the economy, uh, I think it's going to be important to um, gradually implement them, right? I think you don't want to go from zero to 60 overnight. You don't want to go from zero to 10 overnight. Uh, I think that that, you know, sort of will create some more market volatility than I think uh, investors would want. And so I think it's going to be important to pay attention to doing those in a way that markets will find acceptable, right? So what does that, what does that look like? I expect that we'll ultimately end up in a place where it's something like uh, we give to China. Here's a list of demands that, that we have. Here's a list of things that serious adult countries do uh, in the global trading system that they do sort of to make to, to make trade uh, work fairly between trading partners. They respect intellectual property. They don't steal intellectual property. They they do reciprocal market access. They you know they don't do non-tariff barriers. Uh, you know all sorts. You know they let their currencies uh, you know reflect the trade balances. All sorts of things, right? Um, that you think that you know sort of China might you know might 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 have to do. Um, and, you know, once they have this list, you know, so you say something like, OK, you know, here's what you have to do to be, you know, a responsible adult economy. And until you do that, you know, we're going to sort of do tariffs gradually and consistently and do something like 2% a month every month indefinitely. Here's a list. Here's what you have to do to be an adult. Until you do it, you don't get treated like an adult. Um, I think an approach like that would wind up giving tariffs very, very gradually uh, with very clear forward guidance, the type of forward guidance that this podcast is named after, right? <laughs> and and it reduces uncertainty, right? Which is why you use forward guidance, right? And I think that if if in, if corporations and investors have a lot of uncertainty over where things are going, um, you know, are we going to have tariffs of zero or sixty or or ten or twenty? When are they coming down the pipe? Is it a, if it's just one time, then I can sort of just take a one time hit and then look through it and not really change any any of my behaviors. I think if they have clear and gradual forward guidance, it'll do two things. First, it'll, it'll reduce uncertainty. And with reduced uncertainty, you have lower volatility, right? And with lower volatility, you have a much easier economic adjustment to the new policies. And I think it will also give them uh, time and foresight to adjust their supply chain. If you have to adjust their supply chains to the, to the new reality, if you think that there's a one-time shock to tariff rates, you know, uh, tariffs just went from zero to, to, to 50 or something, and, you know, and that's it. And then I can adjust to that. And then, you know, the, it's over. Maybe you don't adjust your supply chain, right? Because the shock was a one-time thing. It was a one-time hit to your, you know, it's a one-time hit and you can, you can move on from it. If there's no end in sight, if the tariffs are going to continue indefinitely, 
I think there's a lot more incentive to adjust supply chains to reduce the risk exposures that we have to China, that they export critical critical stuff to us that's that's absolutely critical for, for national security purposes that they could just cut off on, uh, you know, because you know, because they don't like us or something. That guidance over time, uh, you know, sort of gives foresight, it gives clarity, it eliminates uncertainty, and it gives incentives for long-term action. And most importantly, it doesn't give incentive for urgent action. If, a, if you're a corporation, you know that the tariffs, tariffs are going up 2% a month indefinitely. Uh, you don't have to act tomorrow. You could take your time and take six months, a year, two years, to deal with this because you know you, you know you know that you know you know that it's happening and so you're going to start acting today and making prudent planning for the coming quarters to make the adjustments you don't have to sort of rush it and do it do it today and so this is a way of minimizing vol minimizing volatility and uncertainty and facilitating the greatest amount uh, of of sort of good corporate reactions to the to the you know the inevitable increase in, in trade tensions with China uh, that the president has democratic mandate to, to, to pursue. So look, you know, I think that there's a lot of steps that you could take that move in this direction. And I think that the trick is going to be coming up with ways of implementing them that don't create too much market volatility, that don't create too much uncertainty in the corporate sector, and, and, that, and that shepherd investments, I think, where we want them to go from a national security perspective. So you mentioned that there's this idea of, of buckets in terms of like how these tariffs actually get applied to different nations and how they decide around doing that. Could you just unpack that a little bit further? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, so President Trump has proposed 10 percent, you know, that maybe sometimes higher tariffs on the on the world as a whole. I think that, first of all, those are likely to similarly or sorry, I shouldn't say likely to, but I, I, I would I would I would think that, you know, volatility could be minimized by similarly implementing those in a gradual, in a gradual way, freezing them in over time. But then also, you know, I would, uh, you know, I, I would think that 10% doesn't have to apply evenly to the world as a whole. And so something that Scott Besson, who's one of Trump's close economic advisors, proposed earlier in the year, uh, actually at a, at a Manhattan conference, um, was creating a series of buckets uh, that you could sort of put countries into based on their relationship with the United States. Uh, and countries in you know the the good bucket would have a very low tariff rate imposed on them, and countries in the bad bucket would have the higher tariff rate, you know, say ten percent or something, uh, imposed upon them. And then, to your point about increasingly intertwining national security and tr and and trade, uh, you know, the criteria for creating those buckets, uh, you know, could be pretty broad, right? So they could have things like you know, what are the tariff rates that you put on us? You know, we we want to have similar tariff rates to you that you put on us. How open are your markets? Do you give us open market access? Uh, what non-tariff barriers do you have in place, right? But then you could also think of all sorts of security things, right? Do you pay your NATO obligations or do you shirk your NATO obligations? Do you vote against the United States, the United Nations? Do you help uh, countries like Iran and 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 Russia evade sanctions? Uh, do you help? Uh, develop ways around the ability of the United States to to impose the financial extraterritoriality ter that we discussed earlier earlier in the day, right? There are all sorts of uh, you know security things and economic things that you could think of as comprising the buckets, and you could imagine you could imagine a pretty broad set of criteria and a, and a larger number of buckets that sort of end up determining what tariffs uh, gets applied to different countries. So, you know, when you say something like ten percent on the rest of the world, I mean, yeah, sure, it could it could it could shake out that way. But I don't think it has to. Uh, and I think that the tariffs can be used to incentivize better behavior from other countries when it comes to sharing the defense burden, right? Just like providing reserve current reserve assets puts a huge burden on the American economy and the American worker, providing the global defense umbrella does the same thing because we have to tax ourselves to finance security for the world as a whole. And so if you can use tariffs in this manner to incentivize, you, know, you give countries incentives to do a better job sharing the defense burden do a better job shouldering their load of, of, of providing that, that security umbrella, then I think you've improved burden sharing for those things. And I think that, you know, the U.S. economy is not 50% of global GDP anymore, right? And so by doing, by doing something like that, burden sharing gets enhanced. And I think that's a, a mater that will be a material goal of, uh, of how tariffs get used to restructure the global trading system. Yeah, and I feel like this is where people are getting, you know, hung up a lot is is they hear the outright idea and and they misunderstand it that it's a potential, you know, lever for negotiation to get to this idea of buckets and, you know, you have to you have to come to the, you know, realization that we don't live 
decades ago, like you just mentioned, in a world where, you know, the percentage of total GDP share was much higher for the US. It just simply isn't anymore. So you do need to recalibrate um, away from that. So it is understandable. So, okay, so I want to mention a little bit on the second major component of of the upcoming Trump's policy um, administration economic policies. And this is this idea of currency. So I just want to remind listeners of what we talked about at the beginning of the show, where we discussed this idea of a persistent overvaluation of the U.S. dollar and some of the potential implications of it. So I'm just going to read from the initial chapter of Chapter 3 of Currencies, just a quick sentence here, just to, you know, promise here. Um, but you, you, you write this. In the Triffin world, the demand for reserve assets causes persistent deviations from the equilibria in currency markets that would balance trade. This disequilibrium in trade occurs because the real exchange rate is too strong. Exchange rate overvaluation can be readdressed by tariffs, as discussed above, or by addressing the undervaluation of other nations' currencies, as occasionally floated by folks like President Trump himself and his vice president nominee, uh, J.D. Vance. So with that in mind, I would love for you to just unpack what are some of the potential approaches that they can take to recalibrating dollar valuation. Um, You mentioned this idea of a, a unilateral approach versus a multilateral approach. So perhaps you can just start by unpacking the high level approach and then what are some of the different possibilities depending on which route they go from there yeah totally so um so let me make a couple a couple of broad comments first of all um you know i, I think that there's there's a uh, an element of familiarity and comfort with tariffs so there's two ways of trying to fix the overvaluation right you could use tariffs or you could use a currency approach i think that there's generally speaking a pretty broad familiarity and comfort with tariffs because of the experience of the last administration um, the currency stuff is, I don't want to say experimental because it has been used in the past, but it hasn't been used for a long time, right? You, you just go back, you know, several decades uh, to sort of get back to the point at which the United States was actively using current currency policy in, in the way that I'm discussing in this paper. So it is a little bit more, it is a little bit more, uh, you know, un, unfamiliar to folks and therefore maybe there's going to be some more caution around using it. Nevertheless, I do think it's important to discuss the tools because they may ultimately eventually uh, be on the table, um, and uh, you know, and, and I think in particular, there's a there's a a lot of people in financial markets. Uh, you know, I've seen ten thousand research notes arguing that there's nothing the administration can do to affect the value of the dollar uh, and the value of other currencies, and well, that's not true. You know, like there's tons of stuff that they could do if they want to, uh, and they have various side effects that you can try and fight. Um, but you know, they do have tools. They do have tools to to do them. Uh, to, to do it. So broadly speaking, there's there's two sets of approaches you could take to trying to affect currency markets. Uh, one is a multilateral currency cord. Uh, this has historically been the main way that the United States has pursued um, currency policy. Uh, and the other is various means of unilateral uh, un- unilateral uh, attempts to affect the value of currencies. Uh, and this is more of the type of thing that other countries engage in uh, than have historically engaged in than the United States. Nevertheless, there are definitely are tools and able for doing so if the president ultimately decided this is what he wants to do. The tools, the tools do exist. And again, the reason why I wrote this is because I think it's important for investors to know that the tools are there. So they can think about uh, how would I react if this happened? What would the market consequence of, of, of this be? Multilateral accords, right? Like have been very successful in the past, right? So there's a, you know, if you think about the Paris Accord, sorry, the, 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 um, the Plaza Plaza Accord. Accord. Mm-hmm. The Plaza Accord and the and the Louvre Accord, which happened in Paris, um, you know, uh, you know, they they have in general been been quite successful at at pursuing um, pursuing you know changes to the valuation of the dollar and other currencies. Whether the economic consequences of that or were you know sort of were good or bad, I think are are you know are are more contested among economists. Um, but the fact that they were able to move the currency markets is 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 not contested. Um, and in these multilateral accords, you know, you typically you get you know large amounts of dollar buying or selling by uh, you know foreign central banks and reserve managers. Um, there's a couple there's a couple of issues uh, that I see um, thinking about this as a as a major as a major means of moving forward in currency policy. Um, one is, you know, I think that, you know, the bond market is definitely in a different place than it was in the 80s. <laughs> um, we have a much higher debt GDP load. Uh, you know, deficits are much higher now. Um, we've lived through, uh, you know, in, in the recent past, you know, some some potentially, uh, you know, dramatic moments in the bond market. Um, and I think that, you know, sort of if you are telling folks to, you know, basically go out and, and sell their dollars, 
uh, you know, I think that you have their dollar assets. I think that, you know, there, there needs to be concern for making sure that the bond market takes it well and the bond market doesn't become, you know, uh, doesn't, doesn't become uh, concerned about that and that, in, and that yields don't move materially higher uh, as, a, as a consequence thereof. Uh, and certainly with the bond market in a more fragile place than it was, uh, you know, five years ago, uh, you know, it certainly is. It certainly is something that I that I would think uh, that I would think would be top of mind for addressing. Uh, should you go down the road of of trying to create a, a, a currency court to get other folks to to sell the dollar? Got it. Yeah, and you mentioned you know what possibly is ending up naming it something like the Mar-a-Lago Accord, um, which would be certainly interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so currency accords are are famously famously yeah. named after you know resorts where they're negotiated. Bread and Woods Plaza, you know the the Louvre, which is not a resort, but you know an, an important an important location. And I think that it would you know I, I think that it would be uh, it would be a nice historical a, a nice historical statement uh, for the administration to to, to have a Mar-a-Lago <laughs> accord. Uh, you yeah. know, and, I, and I'm far I'm far from the first person to, to to suggest that that might happen. It's sort of just nice shorthand for it's it's nice shorthand to conceptualize. That what the shape of that could be, uh, that I spend a little time uh, that I spend a little time discussing, uh, drawing a little bit on some stuff that that Zoltan Pozar has has written about as well uh, in in his reading of what various prospective officials, uh, you know, potential officials have said might happen. Um, okay, so you know, when I hear about outright changes in in currency values, the first thing I think about is what are some of the modern tools that we have, especially in relation to the Fed and how it works with the Treasury. So obviously, we live in this world now where we have, um, you know, for example, the Fed has swap lines set up with with a lot, you know, quite a few of of the the broad central banks that they can use yeah. as an executional tool. There's also the Exchange uh, Stabilization Fund. I think I have it right from the Treasury. So how? Um, how are some of these tools potentially coming into this? And also, you know, the, the relation between, you know, as, as you mentioned in, in the paper, um, Scott is, is right now the, the front runner for, for Treasury Secretary. If, for example, he ends up being the nominee and you have that realm over there and then you have um, what we assume is Powell consuming at the Fed. How do those two worlds work together to achieve this policy? What are the dynamics involved? Yeah, so if it's a if it's a multilateral policy uh, policy accord, basically you need to convince other countries that are sitting on large amounts of treasury securities uh, to reallocate those dollar assets into assets of other currencies, probably their home currencies, right? That uh, you know, as I said before, you know, sort of runs. You know, you, you you might be concerned about what happens to the bond market in that situation. And so, one proposal that you've seen that you've seen floated around. Is that you combine it with uh, you combine the currency accord with a duration accord, right? Whereby if other currency, if other countries are are selling some of their dollar assets, potentially they could also be extending the duration of their remaining dollar assets, right? So what do I mean by that, right? So they sell some dollar assets to make their currencies go up in value, to make their currencies reach more more fair values, and at the same time, for their remaining dollar assets, uh, they lengthen the maturity, right? So they're maybe trading bills they own for longer term debt, right? And that longer term debt, you know, sort of could be something innocuous like the types of current thirty years that we issue. Or we could issue, you know, significantly longer term debt per- explicitly for this purpose. Fifty year debt, century bonds, perpetuals yeah. even could be, you know, could 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 be possible for this for this type of environment. And the reasoning for that is that it, it helps it 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 addresses the issue of worrying about bond yields, right? Yeah. Uh, because you're creating a you're creating a significant demand for U.S. long term paper that would offset the decline in demand for long term paper, and it also helps codify the relationship between trade and security umbrellas. And so if you think about the defense umbrella the United States is providing to its trading partners, that defense umbrella is a sort of a public good. And so it needs to be it needs to be financed by the type of uh, by the type of investment that this would that this would entail. What that does is it create it transfers interest rate risk from the US taxpayer to foreign taxpayers. So this is an additional an additional element of burden sharing to help finance the global provision of reserve assets, an additional level of burden sharing to help finance the provision of a defense umbrella, and it transfers that interest rate risk from us to them, and it creates better solvency in the U.S. Treasury market, and it will keep U.S. yields low and prevent them from from uh, impinging on the economy. There's a couple significant problems with this approach, uh, you know, that, that need to be tackled. One is uh, the purpose of reserve accumulation, as you know, is so you can defend your currency in a crisis, right? So other countries can defend their currencies in a crisis, right? 
uh, and cover imports uh, should they have a currency crisis, right? You need bills for that, you need, or, or at least much shorter term notes for that. Uh, yeah. If you need liquidity because you're having, you know, you're Brazil and you're having currency crisis or you're Turkey and you're having currency, you know, whatever, you need liquidity. You don't want duration. You don't want very long-term assets that are not liquid and that will be significantly below par if you have to sell them in a, it, potentially, if you have to sell them in a crisis, right? You want stuff that's going to be trading at par that you can easily cross spreads and, you know, and, and raise liquidity to buy back your own currency or something. So if they extend from bills into century bonds or perpetuals or whatever, you know, look, um, that creates a liquidity problem for them that that obviates the entire purpose of having a reserve portfolio to begin with for many of these, not all of them, but many of these guys. That can get be gotten around with through creative use of swap lines, right? So just like the bank term funding program that swaps duration from banks last spring during the re- wave of regional bank failures and allowed them to post longer term debt in ex- to the Fed in, in, in exchange for short term reserves, something similar could be done here, right? If they if they had a crisis, they could have a swap line with the Fed that allowed them to post back their uh, or or the exchange stabilization fund. Uh, the Treasury could do it without without the Fed if they wanted to, and they they could create a swap line that would allow them to post back at at par their long term security bonds and and it receive in exchange uh, short term you know short term financing um, that they could use to defend their currency you know if they, if if they had to. You can you can you can get around that problem by 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 creative structures as the Fed has done in the past and 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 as is possible. The second, you know, significant barrier to this type of approach is that you got to find someone willing, you know, who has the US dollar assets to sell, right? And whereas the, you know, Plaza and Louvre, you know, those were largely done with Europe and Japan, uh, you know, Japan is still setting up, sorry, still sitting on a huge pile of uh, of its reserve assets, uh, but Europe is no longer sitting on a huge pile of dollar reserve assets, uh, and Japan's are not big enough to really solve the problem. Uh, indeed, the major disequilibrium problem is between the U.S. and China. So a lot of those reserve assets are in countries that um, we don't have the type of relationship with that we had with, you know, Europe and Japan in the 80s. Um, and so getting them to voluntarily agree to this type of accord is going to require sticks and carrots, right? And the tariffs are sticks. Tariffs give you leverage. Tariffs bring uh, bring someone to the negotiating table. Tariffs delivered the phase one deal with China, which they walked away from during the Biden administration. You know, tariffs give you the type of leverage to try and do something like this. But you need sticks and carrots. And I think it's going to be a harder, a harder lift than it, you know, than potentially it was in, in the 1980s. Interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna do my best here to try to summarize that yeah. big picture here. And you can just let me know where I got it wrong or right, or you want to provide yeah. further context. But basically, okay, considering this idea of we're still in this US reserve dollar complex, there's that extra territoriality dynamic that you have. So okay, as as the US hedge money, we're gonna allow we're gonna protect you. But in exchange for that, you know, there's gonna be, you know, part of that carrot is that we will protect you, but in exchange for that, you need to help us with our debt problem here because we have we have some issues with the long bond yields that could get a little bit unruly in this dynamic. So in exchange for that, you need to take on and absorb a significant amount of very long duration debt. Now, obviously, if you know rates are increasing for whatever reason, those bonds could be trading below par, as you mentioned. And if you, for whatever reason, are having to protect your currency, you don't want to be selling these bonds that are trading below par and take the loss. So instead of that, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hold those long duration bonds, but we're gonna set up something similar to the bank term funding program where you can actually swap those in at par with us just in case. Um, and we're gonna set this whole up on a bucketed system, depending on you know like how friendly you are. And then the 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 tariffs program is gonna be also stacked on top of that as well, which is the stick side of things that you mentioned. How does that sound? Is that right? Uh, yeah, but it, it's it's all it's all potential, you know. Like I, I emphasize that I'm 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 trying to I'm trying to show people a catalog of tools that you know that that could be used and sort of think through what the market consequences of them are. Uh, yeah. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm 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 not part of the Trump transition effort, and uh, you know, I can't tell you that's going to happen. Uh, I can just tell you, look, you know, here's, you know, I think people are are insufficiently appreciating the creativity and flexibility with which the various tools could be used to try and accomplish what the ends are. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's a really important lesson is that like never doubt the creativity in, in in finding these new tools and methodologies to achieve their means. The last question here as we wrap up is obviously just, you know, the concern for market 
concern for market practitioners is the potential volatility and markets impact. Um, you make a few points, which is obviously that, um, you know, in, in Trump's eyes, a lot of his success as a president is tied to the performance of, of the stock market. So, you know, just some closing thoughts and perspectives I would love in terms of how you're thinking about the impact of market volatility from these new emerging um, tools. Yeah, sure. So I think I think that's a great point. So, you know, I, I think that President Trump is somebody who cares deeply about financial markets, right? He's somebody who cares deeply about the economy. And don't forget, financial markets can drive the, you know, they can be driven by the economy and they can also drive the economy. And if you had, if you had, you know, sort of significant unwanted volatility in financial markets, it can create a drag in the real economy that you probably don't want. So he is somebody who is very attentive to financial markets in his first term. And I would expect him to continue to be attentive to financial markets in his second term. That means I would expect him to come up with ways of implementing these policies in ways that didn't derail financial markets and didn't introduce too much volatility. And that's along the lines of the graduated forward guidance that I suggested earlier. And I don't know that that's the policy that they're going to do, but I think that they're going to be thinking of ways to ameliorate the harm that could come from too much uncertainty or volatility happening all at once uh, and, and, and look for ways, look for ways to, to mitigate that. The other thing is that you know we didn't we didn't really get to chat too much about the about the unilateral means of of lowering the dollar for time constraints, but that's fine because I think those are even more experimental in terms of thinking about what what they would look like. And and those tools exist. You can use those tools if you've decided this is what you want to do. But there are potential uh, volatility risks to doing so. And then there are steps you'd have to take to try and minimize the volatility, which is a totally different nature than the type of volatility that you get from tariffs. There are tools that you would use along that way. But when you put this together, I think it implies that you. Know, you, know, you use tariffs first and then you, you know, and then only then would you think about doing some currency stuff. And there's a couple of reasons, right? Like one, tariffs give you leverage, as we said a moment ago. So if you're doing some sort of deal, uh, you get better terms for the deal when you have more leverage, right? So you do the leverage up front, right? Two, tariffs are uh, more familiar and they're more comfortable, as we discussed before, right? There's not a big fear to using them because they, they know how they worked last time, right? I think there's some, uh, you know, some uncertainty over how currency approaches would actually wind up working in practice because they haven't really been used in several decades, right? And so I think that there will be, therefore, reason to tread a little bit more cautiously on that ground, even though potentially over the course of four years, you know, if the president decides that's where he, that's where he wants to go, that's where he's going to go. But I, I, I think that, you know, I, I think that there would be some caution at some caution at, at first, right? So I think that if you put if you sort of put the together, I think you sort of get to get to tariffs, you know, pretty much up front. Uh, which is not, you know, there, which is not very far out of consensus. And that's, you know, I think, you know, quite bullish for the dollar. And we're seeing that in markets, right? You know, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing that happen. Uh, and eventually it may turn around and, and, and cause other currencies to appreciate more towards their fair levels if, if we start pursuing uh, dollar driven approaches and currency driven approaches. Uh, but, you know, I think, I think that's sort of where you end up at the start. Well, look, that was a fascinating hour. The paper is fantastic. It's really the question on everybody's heads right now is and, and minds is what does this all mean? You know, we hear these 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 ideas of tariffs, but you know, you don't want to just listen into the headlines on news because it's as he's ex explained in this paper, it's so much more nuanced than that. So I think this will be ho hopefully very helpful. And again, as you've you've emphasized, is this is just a, a potential guide an idea and catalog of ideas that they can experiment with and, and, and potentially use just to really help us understand what are some of the potential implications as we move forward. So, you know, really appreciate you bringing this forward. I think this paper will be very helpful for the investor community at large and, and also policy makers potentially. So I think it's really great. Um, and yeah, really thankful that you came on the show to present it to us, Stephen. Look, thanks for having me back. It's 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 a thrill and an honor to be here, and thanks for taking the time to to discuss this stuff. I think I think we're in for an for for an interesting interesting few years. Yeah, yeah, to say the least. But you know, I I think also to say is that it's a lot, a lot of it is warranted. You know, there's there's these things that are occurring that need to be dealt with. Like as you've shown in the the, the chart of of the share of global GDP, we live in a different world now, and things need to be addressed. So I think that's a really important takeaway for for myself. Yeah. All right. Thanks Thank so much. you.